fashion is all about the here and now. What's a must-have one year can look extremely dated the next. Go back on the fashion timeline for a look at some of yesterday's most memorable collections with a year in fashion. This issue of the Year in Fashion 2009 reflects the tumultuous changes of the global economy. But there were many bright spots. Accessories stayed strong. Young designers emerged. Model faces set trends past and present. And it was a banner year for politics and fashion. In 2009, designers offered pretty clothes and investment-worthy pieces for the budget conscious. The year also brought a new diversity to the runways. We'd all been making a, a huge effort to find uh, more girls of, of color. Sonia Riquel celebrated her 40th anniversary with a Parisian party of the season. I wanted to give her the best ever birthday present. I also wanted to show what Riquel is about. We highlight American Fashion's big night out, the CFDA Awards. Meet some of the designers who dress the nation's first lady and new fashion icon, Michelle Obama. I want to thank you all for making fashion liberating, inspiring, but most of all fun. We take an in-depth look at the worlds of fantasy shoe creator Christian Louboutin and milliner Alberta Swanepoel. The Metropolitan Museum recognized the model as muse with an exhibition and gala. And more from the year in fashion, 2009. With news of worldwide economies in a state of flux, collections were refreshingly upbeat for the spring-summer 2009 season, and a few key trends really made the grade. As a way to stay both on trend and beat the summer heat, transparency never felt this right. That whole sheer nudity thing is really big for, will be big for spring. For a twist on sheer, designers experimented with skin tone shades. It's interesting, we're seeing all these really kind of pale, powdery, nude shades. Fabrics that are almost the color of skin, so when you wear a dress, it almost disappears. There's a real sensuality to it. If the thought of wearing nudes makes you blush, bright colors will also make a statement. Spring summer has become a celebration of transparency and femininity and lightness and a lot of positivity that we need, you know, so show off your body, show off your legs, uh, bright colors, light colors. And I think that fashion is great that way because it always infuses a little bit of lightness where heavy times are around. I love Balenciaga, I love the sheen, I love YSL, again, those autumnal colors, the scarlets and emeralds. I think there's a big fringe thing going on. I mean, we saw fringing at Alberta Ferretti, um, fringing at Joel Sander. A lot of clipping of fabric and fringe. It's going to be interesting to see how all that fringe translates, not only in evening wear, but I think we're going to see it appear many times in day wear as well. Tried and true romance, an ethereal spirit was felt on the runways from New York to Paris. Well, there's a real ethereal romantic spirit here that's happening and a lot of Grecian draping. It's also very important as a trend at the moment. Well, as far as, as far as trends, you know, I think we're still seeing those weird and wacky pants. You know, the season of the dress or the year of the dresses that I think we were talking about dresses for a couple of years there. It's really about pants now and I think credit goes to Stefano Pilati at YSL who a couple of seasons ago started doing that new 
uh, new silhouette, and really everybody you know, keeps on experimenting, and pants are really where it's at. And you know, in addition to pants, I would say that the shoulder is really a key, a key sort of um, erogenous zone, or if not erogenous zone, then just something that designers are really paying attention to. Spirits in the front row were lifted with shoes that defy description. They've been some good shoes, and there's still that need for a, a very, very special shoe, and I think those shoes could take you very far next year if you could walk in them. A certain feeling of joie de vivre infused the summer shows, imparting a sense of optimism. There was a lot of optimism, you're right. Good, we need it. In July 2008, Franca Sozzani and Italian Vogue made headlines with an issue devoted exclusively to black models. The issue sold out worldwide. For the spring-summer 2009 season, the trend for diversity in modeling continued as runways filled with more distinctive faces and moved away from the Russian Revolution that has kept predominantly white Eastern European beauties at the top of the game over the past few years. There's an expression in French, la plus ça change, the more things change, the more they stay the same. 20 years ago, um, Beth Ann Hardison, who's a great agent, you know, she made Tyson into a star, she was my agent. Uh, she said, you know, we need to do something, there's not enough, there's not enough people of color. You know, black people, Asian people, Latin people, Semitic people, Middle Eastern people in these magazines. And it's not, you know, and it's good for people, especially young people, to see their, their kinds of faces represented as being aspirational. There was a time when, you know, being black was not seen as being aspirational. It was seen as being the measure of cool or the measure of toughness or, you know, a measure of sexuality. And now it's the highest aspiration that, you know, you can possibly have. You know, you can be, and, and you don't just have to be Beyonce. You know, you can be Michelle Obama. You can be Barack Obama. Um, and so, you know, we've come, really, really far as a society, and fashion will reflect that. Legendary designer Yves Saint Laurent helped to open the door for black models when he chose Munia, a model from Martinique, as his muse. In 1978, she became the first black woman to appear on an haute couture catwalk. In the 1970s and 80s, the runways were peppered with models of many ethnicities, including Iman, Beverly Johnson, Katucha and Pat Cleveland. In 1992, Veronica Webb broke new color barriers when she signed to be the face of Revlon Cosmetics. The 1990s also brought with it superstars, women like Naomi Campbell, Yasmin Gauri, and Tyra Banks. The new millennium ushered in more new faces. Alec Weck, Devin Aoki, Leah Cabetti, Yuzhuala Rout, Jordan Dunn, Cecily Lopez, and countless others. The spring-summer 2009 season found Arlena Sosa leading the pack of fresh faces. This newcomer from the Dominican Republic was a designer favorite, along with the Indian beauty Lakshmi Menon. All of us, uh, you know, all my colleagues in the fashion industry have been very concerned about the lack of diversity on the runways, and we'd all been making a, a huge effort to find uh, more girls of, of color. Around the world now, the level of economic uncertainty is probably without parallel in my lifetime. As the shows drew to a close, industry players were looking at the upcoming season with hesitation. Recent economic turmoil had led to a lack of consumer confidence, which was beginning to take its toll on the fashion business. I think people are going to buy selectively. 
but they're going to buy the best. If they buy one thing, it's something they can take throughout a season, wear a million different ways, and always feel special. There's no question that most people already have a lot in their closets. People have been buying a lot of fashion for the, for the last few years. They probably still have swing tags on many things. It's time to take off those swing tags and then add in. So I think that there are trends, but it's, whatever people buy will not just be about getting the trend. It'll be about getting something that really updates for them where they've been and where they want to go. And, and ev for everyone, that's a little bit different. People need to understand that going into a bad economy is about making very strong statements. As a retailer, I want the most exciting, the most forward, the most out there. And, but it still has to have a sensibility of wearability. It is time to buy less and buy better, and that probably means less fast fashion. I, I don't think it's about being trendy right now. I think it's about investing wisely and dressing in, a, dressing in an interesting and careful way. I have to make um, women, I have to be more inspiring and to make women dream. Women, women will always want to look beautiful and appreciate luxurious, um, products and dresses, et cetera, et cetera, that whatever the times, they always want to look beautiful. What it does, it makes you um, concentrate much more on what you do best. And that's what houses have to do, isn't it? They concentrate on, their, on what they do best. I think that, you know, everybody today talks about economy. Everybody talks about how is it going to affect fashion. I don't think people will buy less. I think we, people will buy differently. And I think that the only clothes that people will buy today, women will buy today, will be the ones that they will fall in love with, the one that they will be just desiring. And if you find a piece that is irresistible, as they say in French, I know women, they'll have one less dinner, but they'll get the dress. New York's Lincoln Center was site to an incredible group of celebrities, designers, and models for the 2009 CFDA Awards, the most prestigious honor the American fashion industry has to offer. I think it's an exciting time for American fashion. I'm really enjoying being here tonight. Very glamorous evening for me. I don't get out much. I usually stay home and knit. I love being Michael's days, and I love seeing all the beautiful, you know, look around you. There's gorgeous girls everywhere. I love fashion so much. It's something that I've always loved my whole life. Um, but now being here, living in New York, getting to work on Gossip Girl, it's become so much a part of my world, and this is the night for fashion. You know, looking good is the best revenge, it really is. Of course I'm wearing Zach Pose and obviously he made me feel so good. Wearing Calvin Klein this evening. Comfort is key, but you also want to feel sexy and uh, you know, you got something going on. Who am I rooting for tonight? I cheer for everyone, all designers. I know what it is like to be one and it's really a challenge, but at the same time it's the most rewarding thing you do in your life. And with that, the award for the Accessory Designer of the Year went to the Young Guns at Proenza Schooler. We literally just got here, we sat down and like they We're the last people on the red carpet. So we just sat down and the award was just announced, so we haven't really sat down yet. Drink yet. Musician Jack White was on hand to give Anna Sui the Jeffrey Bean Lifetime Achievement Award. It was the retrospective fashion show paying homage to Sui that illustrated why she is so deserving. It's amazing to be able to kind of reflect back and I mean just what I just saw on stage like I never expected to see all those clothes all together all at once and it was pretty pretty mind-blowing to see it all together. I think I was pretty crazy all those years. <laughs> and the menswear designer of the year is... It's a tie. The tie in the menswear category had Scott Sternberg for Band of Outsiders and Calvin Klein's Italo Zucchelli picking up statuettes. I think, as you said before with the movie, my life is going to be the same and I'm just going to be a, probably a little bit happier. Well, honestly, I had no expectations of winning, so I'm in super shock right now. 
America's King of Cool, Mark Jacobs, went home with the International Award for his extraordinary work at the French House of Louis Vuitton. Pretty cool. I mean, that's a great honor. I, I, uh, I've enjoyed uh, working at Vuitton, and uh, it's really done amazing things for me as a person, as a designer, as Robert said, as an artist. Uh, I, I'm a little overwhelmed. First Lady and newly minted style icon Michelle Obama was recognized with the Board of Directors special tribute. I want to thank you all for making fashion liberating, inspiring, but most of all fun. The Swarovski Award Roundup for Emerging Talent saw Alexander Wang win for women's wear. The men's wear recipient was Tim Hamilton. And the accessory nod went to Justin Junta for subversive jewelry. It's amazing to see what a little support can actually do, the huge impact it can have. To the surprise of the Malavi sisters, they were named Women's Wear Designer of the Year for their Rodarte label. And I don't think we ever kind of thought that we'd be nominated for a Designer of the Year or Women's Wear Designer of the Year within the CFDA. It just seems larger than life for us. It's kind of wonderful to stop for a second and kind of congratulate those people who did a good job this year. The French-based house of Louis Vuitton has been creating luggage since 1854 and has grown into an international symbol of luxury. One of the earliest and most visionary designs used by Vuitton was a waterproof canvas. When the LV monogram pattern emerged, it became an early pioneer of international brand name status symbols and quickly accompanied discerning travelers around the world. In 1997, Mark Jacobs was appointed as creative director to develop the first ready-to-wear collection for the house. During his tenure, Jacobs has elevated the accessory brand into a must-see show on the Paris fashion calendar and has attracted a notable celebrity following. I thought it was superb. I thought it was really excellent. You know, it's LV. The top of the top, the best of the best. Creme de la creme. but he has been even more successful in revamping the label's famous accessories. Collaborating on the bag designs with contemporary artists such as Steven Sprouse, Takashi Murakami, and Richard Prince. Where his real genius, his sort of commercial genius, explodes is with the accessories. I thought the bags were absolutely remarkable, the way every season he's able to take the Vuitton handbag and make it the bag that everyone's going to want to have. You could see the cynical side of it and say, oh, it's commercial to put so many bags on the runway, but he does it with a sort of wink and a laugh, and, and I think that that ability to constantly keep it light and keep it funny and keep the cash register ringing is an unbelievable talent. Mark's designs continue to be admired on the runway, and he manages to consistently keep the Louis Vuitton label modern and covetable. To be able to grow and, and start this new French family. It's been a great experience, and I'm just, you know, I'm glad that I'm really enjoying fashion again. Well, I started making shoes a while ago now. If we're talking under my name, it's been 16 years from now. I started my company in the beginning of 92. Basically, I really started thinking of shoes when I was a child. I was born and raised in Paris, so I would always go to a music hall and cabaret to see basically showgirls. So really, the first thing which I thought about is that I wanted to do shoes for showgirls. So my first job actually has been when I was 17. I worked for the Folie Berger, basically, Nobody is as good as a, as a showgirl when it's about high heel shoes. So then I started to work for different companies, Jordan, Chanel, Saint Laurent, and then I started my company. I started almost with an accident. I just thought, you know, 
I want to do my shoes and I want them to be pretty and to be on pretty, on pretty women. That's it. I never thought of it as a business. The story of the infamous Red Soul involved an assistant with a pension for polish. First prototype arrived and it was in the color of the actual drawing. And I was looking at the drawing and I was looking at uh, the reality and it was very close. But the drawing was better. And then at one point, Van Gogh had Sarah who was working with me and she was painting her nails. I look in the, the shoe and there was this massive black sole. So I grabbed her nail polish and painted the sole and then suddenly it was, you know, like a revelator, poof, you know, the drawing came back to life. Everything which has to see with a, a way of being flirtatious without being ostentatious is a thing that I always liked in the possible idea of how women play with their own femininity. So, you know, it was no longer in my hands, it became immediately my identity and in a way my trademark. Bonjour, Here we're basically in a place which is not only a, an experimental place but also a place for bespoke between the cutting, taking, you know, taking the leather, erasing the leather a little bit, etc., starting to cut it, then stitching the parts, then putting all the le boudure, etc., the, the, the glue, all these things. It's more, more or less 100 operations. It always starts around here, avec Laurence. We have the skins which are on your right. So we do the patterns and then we start cutting. And then after, here, see we stitch the shoes like Nadette. Before basically being put on the last, the last is the body of a shoe, basically. And so it's this body which sort of molds the shoe and then it stays on the last as long as possible so it really keeps the shape sort of forever. You start to put the sole, and then after the sole is going to be cut properly, repainting on the border. You take off the last, and then after, you do the finishes. I did you a shortcut. <laughs> huh? For me, a shoe is never beautiful before I, I really saw it on a woman's foot, because sometimes shoes are beautiful, can be photogenic, but when you see them, it's bad for the ankle, it looks, it makes the foot fat. So really, I cannot say that I, that I ever think that a shoe is beautiful as long as I have seen it on a woman's foot. You see this shoe, for instance, called the Siamese, is definitely not great to walk. It's wonderful as a designer to keep your drawings. Sometimes you would love to see them as exaggerated you know, in reality. But the reality is a different story, so you have to be able to do both. I'm very dedicated to women, and so I'm much more dedicated to women than I'm dedicated to fashion. Louboutin has an incredibly loyal following among today's celebrities, but with one sexy performer, there's even more synergy. He loves showgirls. I'm a showgirl. The higher the heel, the better. The more extravagant, the better. Someone like Dita is definitely very knowledgeable about a lot of things, but extremely knowledgeable about shoes, for instance. First time I saw that red sole on a black pump, I was hooked. They've never let me down. I've never broken a heel. They've never, ever let me down even once. That's saying something because those, they, you know, they live a hard life, those shoes. At an event at Barney's New York, women swarm the fourth floor of the store to have their shoes uniquely autographed by the man who dreamed them up. It gave Louboutin a chance to interact with his fans, some more famous than others. He makes me 10 foot high, so tall, and he makes me feel like a princess and a goddess and everything feminine and sexy and beautiful. Sonia Riquiel celebrated 40 years in business with a fashion extravaganza that took place in a park on the outskirts of Paris. While guests dined with views over the city, models were prepped backstage. You can see like big clouds of hair, kind of quite Sonia Riquiel kind of inspired. It's her 40th birthday, so kind of like a nod to her heritage style. 
They wanted the girls to feel sort of quite fresh and very young and youthful, but a little bit sophisticated, so not too young. It's a fantastic celebration. Total and utter Parisian chic. It has not been diluted from the very first moment Sonia sent her first collection down the runway 40 years ago to this very day. What Sonia um, achieved was the perfect sense of Gallic chic. It was the absolute perfection of French chic in those days. I'm so proud of my mom. I think she's a, an extraordinary woman. I think she's accomplished something amazing, you know. And uh, I wanted to celebrate that. I think the most important thing I learned maybe is to find always this balance between something that is a bit off, a bit quirky, but at the same time very desirable. It's just sensational, you can't replicate it. She does Paris chic par excellence. I wanted to give her the best ever birthday present. I also wanted to show what Riquel is about. I was absolutely surprised. And it was very am amazing. And also I wanted to try to change a little bit the way people look at fashion. I wanted to show that something that has never been done before, that all the designers in the whole world, the best of them, can gather together to celebrate one of them. I mean, people from Yuji Yamamoto, to Karl Lagerfeld, Jean-Paul Gaultier, Monsieur Giorgio Armani, Monsieur Ralph Lauren, that's really amazing. Sonia Luca is such an inspired woman, I love her. So I thought about her, like, okay, she's red hair, but let's, she's all the time dressing black, so let's do a, a red and black dress. And she's a literary woman, so I put a lot of words in the dress. It's an outfit that I myself wear. It's an all-in-one black sequins, very glamorous. Just thought it suited Sonia Riquel somehow. She's kind of iconic, you know, especially for a female designer. I think that you look at her and go, yeah, you know, there's not many of us. She's one of, one of the gang, and she's obviously done incredibly well. The print with her face on, and then I made a sweater very Sonia Riquel, the kind of Sonia Riquel from the 60s, huh? with silk pants and a blouse out of the material. And I even had the buttons made at Chanel with her face on, a thing like that. She was truly in the air of the changement of the woman's lib liberation and like a very graceful, very feminine and at the same time strong, energetic and sensual woman, you know. For us, she's like a goddess, she's like a mother in a way. Natalie gave us all the themes and the, uh, the stripes, the sequins, black and white. We put everything Natalie asked for the same dress. I thought about her, her style, I thought about the sweaters and her humor, and so I thought, wow, this is like super Sonia. I was trying to capture the essence of what is Sonia to me. 40 years in fashion is such an achievement. Fashion's so fickle. As I said to Sonia, bon anniversaire perhaps, uh, but the most important thing is, as the French say, bon continuation, to continue. Hi, I'm Alberto Swanepoel and I'm a milliner um, in New York City. You know, I'm not, uh, I think, the extravagant, theatrical sort of milliner, although I, you know, I can do things like that, but my hats, I feel, are definitely much more sort of wearable. So that's what I really love doing. I think it's very important that women look obviously beautiful and it's so close to their face and the proportions should be great. And my favorite saying, which I've said way too many times, is um, Christine Lacroix said, the hat is the dot on the eye. And, um, and it's like an exclamation mark, you know, it sort of finishes an outfit. Hats are, are 
traditionally made with, with wooden hat blocks. Um, and so every block um, is a certain shape. This is a hat that I'm busy blocking. The felt was in this, this shape it came in. And then I would put water and stuff inside and then leave it on this Jiffy steamer for several hours that the moisture goes into the felt. You steam it a lot and then you literally pull the, the felt over the shape. Um, to keep it shape, and then like this is a fedora on the making. So um, this is um, rattan that I get from Europe as well, and these pins are from France. They special blocking pins to keep the indents, for instance, you know, in the shape to hold it till it's dry, because the the felt will take on the shape. And the same with these indents. And then it stays on here for literally about 12 hours if I do it normally, um, and then the felt completely dries and then you mark your center front and back and take off all the ropes and everything and brush it and then take it off the block and then you finish the hat by the ribbon and the, if it needs wire or whatever. It's really challenging working with the designers. Um, everybody has his own sort of specific vision um, and so it's exciting for me because I get to do a lot of different um, things creatively and technically challenging to me sometimes. It's really a very different project and different mindset with every designer that I work with. This is for, uh, for Jason Wu. I'm making all these little vintage jewel head pieces. He came to me and he said that he um, wanted to do these sort of ethereal um, sort of head pieces. So I have all these really great um, face veilings. Um, in really sort of really incredible colors. It's a simple sort of concept, but I think it's sort of effectively on the runway. Yeah, these actually are, I'm doing busy for, for Mark by Mark, and um, they are actually made from, um, from these felt. So I, I take the actual felt and I have a pattern that I then cut out. Um, so they're pretty time consuming because this fabric is very rigid and um, more difficult to work with than fabric, but it has a, a great look. And for Alexander Wang, I did very interesting, incredibly modern, um, almost like Game Ranger helmets, but they, we had, I had to get a block built in for the shape that he wants, and these incredibly stiff, hard leather brims. Um, they're going to be pretty stark and I think visually pretty sort of arresting. It's, it's very, a very strong shape. And then Nathan Jenden, which shows in London, I always do, I must say, really challenging, interesting things. He's, a, he's an incredibly creative designer and he really um, pushes my technical abilities a lot. Last fall I did these beaded masks for them. They look pretty beautiful in the end. I'm starting with Narciso. It's a really pretty modern thing um, and that to me is, would be fantastic if he uses it because he doesn't really do hats in his shows. It's, it's not the 40s and the 50s anymore that everybody wears a hat, and so it's becoming a very niche field. It's great for me because people are slightly getting to know me, and I offer the service to designers, and so it's very, very specialized. But then also it's such a small thing that, you know, I don't think I'll become a, a millionaire from, from doing this, basically, so, <laughs> you know. Like yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, the millionaire millionaire, that's what I want to be, so. <laughs> Everything I loved was in fashion. That was how it all came about. I, it just was really organic. It was an organic process. And decided, you know, I was going to go to Parsons, and I was going to graduate, and I was going to become a fashion designer. Unlike many others, Jason Wu's dreams became a reality. And just days before his resort collection, the young designer gave us a preview. The fun resort collection that ushers the way, for, you know, sort of make way for spring. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, we're fitting our first girl today for our show. Then we should talk about hair and makeup, too. Resort Collection was sort of inspired by Iris Arpol and her sort of eclectic style. So I wanted to sort of get the inspiration in, in the form of sort of quirky prints, bright highlighted colors. Do you have a pair of shoes, Colin? These are gorgeous. 
this is like chic. This is um, so I didn't do the fitting. It's perfect too. Yeah. It's good. yeah. It's I'm gonna actually fit this. I'm just gonna fit it on her actually. Okay. Shall we? Or yeah. I, you know, I think in the beginning you have to do everything yourself, and I still do a lot of the hands. You know, I do all the fittings myself, and I'm very hands-on. Seeing it on the girls and seeing like your sketch come in, come to life. I think that's my favorite part. Because, you know, it's like usually from a sketch, you have to, you know, it's such a long process from start to finish. That sometimes, you know, like right now when you see it, the girl that's actually going to be wearing it is really rewarding. Let me turn around for a second. Particularly rewarding for Wu is the attention he has received from the First Lady. Mrs. Obama's worn his creations on the cover of Vogue and to her husband's historic inauguration. Turning on TV and seeing um, the first lady in my dress was pretty much a life-changing experience and really, <laughs> you know, it had already dropped everything and, you know, screamed for half an hour because it was so exciting. You know, it really was about everything my collection embodied. It was beautiful, it was light, airy, and optimistic. It never stops exciting me seeing, you know, the final product on the girl, on the woman. I know, it looks pretty good, right? It's like perfect on top. It's about movement, you know? I thought this like sums up the resort. You're welcome. The collection really came together since I saw you on Tuesday and um, you know it was really, you know, it's it's just show. I love it and it was just, you know, I had a lot of fun designing it. I think that he's really taking on the mantle of a young Bill Blass, you know, someone who does grown-up clothes for uh, real women. I think he's not interested in being the latest hip thing on the block. Charles James was definitely one of my first and foremost, you know, major influences. I mean, the construction was so amazing, and I thought, you know, how do I bring that to the new generation, the girls of my generation? I'm a designer slash businessman, you know, I, I design, but I also want to, I also want to be smart about it. And uh, as conceptual as collections get, at the other hand, really think about what my customers want from me. And I think it's really important for a designer to be, um, to be a little bit of both. I made it, yeah. Everybody always gets a kick out of that. I have it for good luck. Oh, I was in boarding school when I was 16, and I uh, got a freelance job designing dolls. And it sort of became a mini career of its own. And it was really interesting because I really learned a lot about business and how to, how to work, you know, you know, being a working environment. And I really helped with starting my fashion business three years ago. So, um, you know, it's something I still do, and I love it. It's, again, a form of art. You know, it's about attention to detail. It's about making beautiful things. And that's, at the end, what I love doing, making beautiful things. I go to work every day, and I feel inspired. I feel happy. The art of fashion is my passion. That's something I really love doing. You know, I can't imagine doing anything else. But I could be a cook, though. That's very artistic, too. Michelle Obama is an incredible first lady. She's a great role model. She has so much style. I think she's a first lady that's not afraid to um, enjoy fashion, and yet I don't think she's making her life that her lifetime goal. So it's kind of very refreshing. We're so lucky to have Michelle Obama, a first lady with such confident style and such reassuring style. Her and President Obama has really brought optimism to the country, and it's, um, it's really great. She's so amazing. She is a woman about women for women, and representing the family, this country, is so exciting. Michelle Obama is shaking things up. What she puts on sells clothes. And I love the fact that she is supporting so many designers right now that don't have huge corporate sponsorship and big money behind them. She's breathed new life into many young designers' brands, and she's given them a future. One of the first designers to be thrust into the spotlight by Michelle Obama's support was Isabel Toledo. Wearing Toledo's Lemongrass Ensemble at her husband Barack Obama's inauguration really set her apart from the crowd. 
she really brought that to life. I mean, I knew what I wanted to capture. I knew I wanted that luminosity, but she just, she sparked. I mean, she was like, she was so amazing and inspiring that somehow that moment stayed in everybody's sub subconscious. Toledo's work is admired by many fashion insiders. She focuses on technique and experimentation. In 2007, a job as creative director for Anne Klein, though short-lived, helped make her work more accessible. Inauguration Day was also special for Jason Wu. Michelle Obama chose Jason's white gown to wear to Washington, D.C.'s many celebratory balls. Turning on TV and seeing the uh, first lady in my dress was pretty much a life-changing experience. Designing his own line since 2006, the Taiwan-born designer's work has feminine and modern qualities. And as Mrs. Obama continues to wear his designs, the world keeps watching. From Taiwan, went to Canada, you know, traveled around Paris, studied in Tokyo, came back and went to, you know, college here at Parsons. And he's only been in business like three and a half, just under four years. He's 26 and zap, you know, overnight, he's a household name. Michelle Obama sported French-born, New York-based designer Sophie Taylor's elegant striped shirt dress to the unveiling of the bust of poet Sojourner Truth. I was really proud and honored. And because she wears that dress for something like very special in my art too, because it was for the Sojourner Truth, I was really touched. After working as Azadine Elias design assistant for 10 years, Sophie launched her own line in 2005 in New York and continues creating unique and colorful collections at her Brooklyn studio. Another design name that is popular in Michelle Obama's closet is Takoon. We asked if this new notoriety has created a ripple effect for his business. It's not a ripple effect, it's a tsunami effect, I think. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's phenomenal. I'm, I'm really honored. Takoon debuted his line in 2004, coming to design after spending four years as a writer and editor at Harper's Bazaar. And his work highlights his talent at crafting feminine yet contemporary looks. Wearing a red and black dress from Narciso Rodriguez on election night, Mrs. Obama set tongues wagging. Narciso has become a staple, along with another New York favorite, Michael Coors. In addition to Michelle Obama's support of new and niche designers, she also favors the chic ensembles found in the J. Crew catalog, giving every woman the opportunity to match a first lady's style. I think she's great because she just wears what, what she wants. She doesn't care what people think. She just picks, you know, one day she'll wear J. Crew the gap, the next day she'll wear something for me, the next day she'll wear something from Mr. Valtolita, which is very couture. She is the total independent. The Costume Institute at New York's Metropolitan Museum of Art recently celebrated their latest exhibit entitled Model as Muse, Embodying Fashion. And while celebrities paraded up the red carpet as usual, this time models took center stage. That's right, that's right, the model as muse. Right, I only know models as pains in the butt for the most part, but you know, I'm just teasing. It's about time, I think we're, we've all been looking forward to this day. Well, I'm honored, you know, and it was such a wonderful time when I was a model and uh, with Vogue. I think it's, it's a fantastic uh, job and I'm really grateful that I'm a part of this. It was fab, it was better than going to school. I loved it and I traveled the world and I met amazing people like Fred Astaire and Andy Warhol and Paul McCartney and extraordinary. I'm so excited that they've decided to really focus on the model. Tonight could be a kickoff to really truly bring her back. Model is Muse and Body Fashion began because we're just looking through old magazines and we realized that in any era, there are certain women who embodied the period ideal, but in addition to that has something extra. She also has a distinctive identity and she's able to interpret the clothes in a way that makes them uh, not simply provocative and seductive, uh, but something that women can identify with. She advances fashion. 
exhibition begins in 1947. 1947 was Dior's new look, which really did change the way the feminine physique was idealized. It was nipped in waists, so very, very fitted and padded, a very hyper-feminine physique. 1947 was also the year Ford Models started in New York City, which really made a respectable business out of modeling. So in the 40s, you have a very rarefied, very kind of aristocratic grandeur. Someone like Susie Parker, Dorian Lee, they looked the part. They looked like both Hollywood starlet and society matron. So there was a sense of grown up and sophisticated. In the 60s, that goes right out the window because it's about the girl. It's about sex, drugs, rock and roll. It's Twiggy, it's Penelope Tree, it's the scene. And youth culture takes over. So in this sense, the body type, the ideal, that youthful, juvenile, beauty almost, long legs, slim, not too voluptuous, that body type was actually reactionary against the mature sophistication of the 50s. In the 70s, women enter the workforce in unprecedented numbers. So you get a workaday fashion as well, which is probably not the most exciting clothing in the world, some of it, yet it was made exciting by narratives by the photographers. So you have the Helmut Newton narratives where there's sexual danger and power play. But the 70s was about the body more than anything else. It was worked out all American athletic body. And the clothing didn't leave you anywhere to hide. There was no padding, the bras were gone. So you really had to, more than ever, have the body that was the body of the era to be chic, almost more than now. What's interesting about supermodels, they brought the personality to the mainstream. Each one of the supers was identifiable, immediately recognizable, and that was what was interesting. They became celebrities. They weren't just models. They were full celebrities, and in some ways, their fame almost eclipsed the very industry that created them. Kate kind of ruptured the reign of the supermodels in a funny way. The grunge did that in some way. There was a kind of shakeup whereby beauty culture took a look and said, wait a minute, we've had the excesses and the perfection and the over-the-top 80s. Let's look for a new type of beauty. And in comes Kate Moss, five foot seven, not the voluptuous body type that everyone had been worshiping in the past. Really, it was time to reassess what it meant to be beautiful. The point, of course, of this exhibition is seeing it through the lens of uh, the fashion model, uh, her history. It's amazing, but the fashion model uh, hasn't been the focus of an exhibition as um, a profession uh, in all of these years, and yet she's so ex important as a contributor to uh, what fashion is, how we perceive it.